You're listening to the Finding Christ in the Old Testament series, preaching by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. 1 Kings chapter 21 this morning. 1 Kings chapter 21. Let's look together now at verse number 1. We're continuing the sad, sad story of Ahab and a life that was given for self. Verse number 1 of chapter 21. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And here we're introduced to a new character. It's Naboth. And unfortunately for Naboth, he has a vineyard, a piece of land, next to Ahab's, his summer home in Jezreel. Verse number two, and Ahab spake with Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it better vineyard than it, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And so Ahab sees this vineyard next to him, thinks it would make a good veggie garden, and says, Listen, I'll trade for it, or I'll pay you for it. And sounds reasonable. Verse number three. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And, and we might be tempted to read past that and think, Well, Naboth is just being a hardhead. He just doesn't want to sell his property, and, and that's the end of it. But it would be unwise to do that this morning because there are some things that we should notice about this text. The first thing is this. Naboth says, the Lord forbid me. If you'll notice in the text, the Lord is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is the name Yahweh. It is Jehovah. It is the true God of Israel. And remember the context this morning. We are talking about Jezreel. We're talking about Samaria, a land that has been given to the worship of Baal. So even in that statement, we're clued in here that Naboth has a relationship with the living God. Not only that, he says, God forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my father. Again, really important. Because when Israel came to the promised land, the gift to God's redeemed people was a land. And the land was allotted to the different tribes. And so each tribe got a portion, and in that tribe, each family received an inheritance. It was their gift from God for their family. And, according to Leviticus chapter 25, Numbers 36, that land, that gift, was to stay in the family. The truth is, if you were poor and you needed some money, you could sell your land. But even with that, the land was to stay in your family, and on the year of Jubilee, the land would be returned to you. So, When Naboth says, no, I'm not selling the land, God forbid, this is my family inheritance, he is saying that for biblical reasons. He's not just being a hardhead. He's saying, wait a minute, I can't do this according to Torah, according to the word. Verse number four. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased, or sullen, or vexed. He is not a happy camper at this point because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And, this is Ahab now, he laid him down upon his bed, turned away his face, and would eat no bread. Now listen, you you need to envision this. Because here is the king of Israel. And what he's doing now is, after he's told no, He is laying on his bed with his back turned to everybody and saying, I don't want to eat. That's exactly what he's doing. He is pouting at this point. When we were kids, we had a bedtime, and the bedtime was 7.30. Always. It didn't matter. 7.30, you were going to bed. Any parents like that, do you remember those days? 7.30. There there was no debating, 7.30 you were in bed. And I can remember on one occasion crying because it was in December and there was a Rudolph Christmas special on at 8 o'clock and I really wanted to see it, but it was like, no, 7.30 is bedtime. 
And on one occasion, we were told to go to bed, went upstairs. We had an upstairs, a, a staircase that went from the front door to the upstairs where our bedrooms were at. And when my dad told us to go to bed, we went upstairs. And then all of a sudden, I heard a knock on our front door. And then I smelled this aroma in our house of pizza. You parents are guilty of this. And so as a fairly young boy, I would smell the pizza and I would sneak out of my room and creep to the top of the steps and peek around the corner. I'd say, hey, what's going on? And I would say, get up to bed. Hey, did you order pizza? Go to bed. And when my dad, so it's like, oh, can we have go to bed? So we went back in the room and I tell you, I can remember throwing this temper tantrum in my room, crying and wailing. I mean, a drama queen. And after a while, my mom came up and said, okay, if you want a slice of pizza, you can come down. And I laid on my bed with my back turned, and I said, no, I don't want to. And in my family, guess what? No conjoling. She shut the door and said, fine, you won't have any. And for the rest of the night, I said, please, come up here. I want pizza. I want pizza. I want pizza. <laughs> and it never happened. It never happened. And here's Ahab. He's pouting. He didn't get what he wanted. He wanted this veggie garden. Verse number five, Jezebel, his sweet wife, comes by and says, what's wrong, sweetie pie, honey bun? That's the Hebrew. That's the original text. That's, that's what it says, literally. And watch what Ahab says in verse number six. And he said unto her, because I spake unto Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said unto him, give me thy vineyard for money, or else... I will, if it please you, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. Anything wrong with that statement? What's wrong with it? Yeah, he misquotes Naboth here. And you might wonder why he does that. Well, one reason for sure is because his wife Jezebel couldn't care less about Yahweh, his law, the Torah, Leviticus, or Numbers. She's a pagan. She's a worshiper of her Baal. She doesn't care. But the other reason that he does this is because when he leaves out this important fact on why the land will not be sold to him, he makes himself look better. He becomes the victim. Now his case is even stronger because he conveniently left out all of the facts. Now, I know we would never do this, would we? We would never tell half-truth or leave part of the story out to make ourselves look better, but Ahab did this, and he does it for a reason. He wants to be the victim. He wants his wife to feel sorry for him, and she does. Verse number 7, And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thy heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. She says, aren't you the king? Listen, sweetheart, go eat some Cheetos. Be happy. Mama's going to take care of this. Now watch verses 8 through 14, and just understand how cold and callous and sterile uh, what happens next is by Jezebel's hand. Verse number 8. So she wrote letters to Ahab's name and sealed them with the seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in the city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, sons of Belial, which means they're worthless, they're guys who would do anything for money, they're worthless fellows, before him to bear witness against him saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he might die. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles, who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, And set before him, and the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned, and he's dead. 
I mean, that's it. So she sends a letter and says, look it, proclaim a day of prayer. Have the whole city gather. Bring Naboth in. And as he's sitting front and center, have two worthless witnesses come and say, hey, listen, we heard him swear by God he would sell his land. Now he's reneged. Now he needs to die. And all the people say, okay. They take him out of the city and bash him to death. And if you'll read further in 2 Kings chapter 9, you'll find that they liquidated his sons as well. There's no more inheritance for this family. The boys are dead. The father is dead. The vineyard is now up for possession. Verse 15. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. Problem solved. Problem is solved. Ahab hears this, verse 16. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that he, Ahab, rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite and to take possession of it. Good deal for Ahab. Doesn't ask any questions. Doesn't want to know why he's dead. Maybe a heart attack. Don't know. He's gone. Problem solved. But the problem was that God knew about it. Verse number 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth. Now notice, it's still Naboth's vineyard. God never recognized this as his land. It was Naboth's land. But Ahab is there. He went down to possess it. And this is the story of Naboth. Great story, eh? Mm -mm. It's not a great story, but there are great lessons here. I think there are three truths that hopefully will help us this morning and encourage us. I think two are self-evident, that when you see them, you'll understand. I think the third one, may you might need some help in seeing. So it's there, though. Here's the first lesson we learned from Naboth. Naboth's story reminds us of the lot of God's people in this world. This story of Naboth, right, being mistreated, being falsely accused, losing his life, reminds us of the lot of God's people, not just in Jezreel, but in the real world today. Right? And if you doubt that to be true, listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, Think not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. Peter says to New Testament believers, hey, don't be surprised when bad, terrible things happen Don't be surprised when suffering comes your way. This is the lot of the believer. So, with that in mind this morning, when you hear the televangelist say to you, God's design for your life is to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And God's design for the believer is so that no sickness, no sorrow, no I mean none is to come your way. Not headache, not sinus infection, not toothache. Because of God, he has designed that you live healthy, wealthy, and wise. There's a problem with that. Because that is not God's design. And if that were the case, one might ask, why is it then that Naboth, a follower of God, goes in front of a kangaroo court and is bashed to death outside of Jezreel? And that story, that theme, repeats itself over and over again in Scripture. The disciples of Jesus Christ, every one of them, at least 11, gave their lives for their testimony. They were martyred, they were tortured, they were beaten, their brains were bashed out, they were, they were impaled with spears, they were flayed alive. And John, the survivor, the oldest 
that lasted the longest was, church tradition tells us, boiled in oil and banished to Patmos. And so we read the story of Naboth, we must understand this is not unusual for the believer in Christ. And Paul picks up the same theme. Listen to Romans chapter uh, 8, verse 36. And here it's obvious that, that Paul must have missed the broadcast by Benny Hinn. He must have missed this episode by Creflo Dollar or Kenneth Copeland. Because here's what Paul says to believers. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. I mean, I don't know, but that doesn't sound like healthy, wealthy, and wise to me. It doesn't sound like name it and claim it to me. It doesn't sound like take your wallet out and claim that it's filled and it will happen to me. I've tried it. It didn't work. It sounds to me that God's lot, God's people, their lot in life in this fallen, dark world is that we will suffer, that we will struggle. That's the way it goes. And so if you're looking for a church or a ministry that is promising the the moon to you, that just come to Jesus and all of your wild fantasies will come true, this is not that church. If you're looking for a church that's cool in our world today, this certainly is not that church. From leadership down. Why? Because the church isn't to promise you the moon, and the church isn't to try to be cool in our world today, but the truth, the church is truth. It is the truth. And the truth of the matter is that God says to his people, listen, this world at times can really stink. And you can really struggle. And, like our story, such injustice will often be inflicted by government and courts. I won't read all of Romans chapter 13 this morning, but let's just run through it quickly. Paul writes, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. He's talking about government there. He goes on in verse number 2 and says, don't resist it. There's a purpose. There's a God-ordained reason for government. It's God's plan. It's God's program. Verse number 3, rulers are terror if you're doing something wrong. They're to, to provide punishment and justice. Verse number 4, he talks about them being ministers for good, right? They don't bear the sword in vain. Verse number 5, um, be subject to them. Verse number 6, pay your taxes. And verse number 7 says this, Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to custom, fear to fear, honor to honor. Government has a God-ordained role. There's a purpose. God ordained it. And when it's good, it's really good. And we're encouraged by men and women who take that step into politics. I don't know why they do it, to be honest with you. Really. But they do it. And we thank God. And we thank God for Christian men and women who go into politics and try to bring government back to its role, its God-given, God-ordained role. And we've seen that. As Canadians here this morning, I'm sure we're all aware that last holiday we had, our civic holiday on the 6th, uh, in Toronto they celebrated John Graves Simcoe Day. I'm sure we all knew that. I did. And Simcoe was the lieutenant governor of Upper Canada, which is Ontario. And in 1791... He he came into being the lieutenant governor, um, and he was a devout believer in Christ. Devout believer in Christ. And he believed in the dignity, um, the freedom, and the humanity of every living being, regardless of skin color, race. And so in 1793, the first time in the British Empire, an act against slavery was passed into law, by Simcoe. And by 1810, listen to this, not one slave in all of Ontario. And it wouldn't be till another 24 years that the rest of the British Empire caught up to Ontario and abolished slavery. 
That's a good thing. And we would need more men and women like that today. And government, when it fulfills its God-ordained roles, is a good thing. But sometimes government gets outside of those roles. And when it does, the people who will suffer will be believers. I'm just telling you, my brother, my sister, this is an attack. You can put a political face on it if you want to. It's an attack against Western society. It's an attack against Christian ethics and value. It's an attack against the home and family. So don't be surprised. That's exactly, Jesus says this. Look at um, Matthew. No, Mark 13, 9. I'm sorry. Mark 13, 9. Jesus says, take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils and in synagogues. You shall be beaten and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for testimony against them. And so here's the point. Naboth's story reminds us that the lot for believers is not paved with sunshine and roses. The lot for believers is we will suffer, we will struggle, and we must remember this. All I know is I'm not home yet. This is not where I belong, right? I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm looking for a country whose builder and maker is God. And with that in mind, I will not be surprised. I will not be discouraged. I will not quit when I understand this is a lot for believers. Number two, the story of Naboth teaches us this, and this is, I think, obvious. There is a price to pay for standing on God's word. The story is not about grapes or gardens. It's not. It's about God's word. Because what Naboth has done is said this. Hey, listen, the Torah, Leviticus 25, number 36. He wouldn't have known the chapters. They didn't have them, but he knew it was there. You can't do this based on God's word. And that decision to base his life on a godly principle cost him his life. My brother and sister in Christ, listen to me. If this morning you believe that this book is true and you're going to base your life on this book, I have news for you. It's going to cost you something. Husbands this morning, if you believe this book and you love your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, if you seek to provide and protect and to wash her in the word, it will cost you something. If you're a wife here this morning and you look at the word and you say, I am to respect my husband as the church is to Christ. In our culture, that thought is going to cost you something. If you're a parent this morning and you want to bring up your children in the nurture and admission of the Lord and teach them the truth of God's word and God's law and God's principles in our culture as it's running to hell in a handbasket, that idea will cost you something. If you're a worker today, an employee, and you want to work as unto the Lord, not as I service, as a man pleaser, and you're going to be honest and right and a man or a woman of integrity in this world, following God's word will cost you something. If you believe God's word that we are to forgive as we've been forgiven, and then you're going to absorb the cost of that hurt and that pain, it will cost you something. And if you believe what the Bible says, that we are to preach the gospel to every living creature, and you follow this word, it will cost you something. At the very least, it will cost you comfort, acceptance, self-denial, self-sacrifice. It will cost you embarrassment. Maybe friendship, promotion, position, a place at the table. Don't want to hear from you folk, you backwoods, archaic thinkers. It may cost you your possession. Or in much of the world today, it might cost you your freedom and even your life. This is not a game. This is a war. This is a battle. And if you believe God's word, it will cost you something. And I think most of us here would say, oh, yeah, you know, you're right. I envision myself just like Naboth. I, I just stand on God's word. I just stand on God's principles. And we want to tell ourselves that and believe that. But I have a hunch this morning, for most of us, myself included, we're not as much like Naboth when it comes to the consequences of our actions as we might be with the elders of Jezreel. 
Because the elders of Jezreel get this letter, and they know it's wrong. They know it's not right. They know that Naboth is practicing biblical principles, and not one of them says anything. Nothing. No one says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not right. This is a problem. Can you believe what the government's doing here? I can't believe this. Naboth is right. He's following the law. He's following the Torah. This is wrong. Do you know why no one in Jezreel said anything? You want to guess why? They're scared to death. Literally. Scared to death. And I have to tell you this morning, I think for most of us, we get confronted with the word of God this morning, and I'm talking to all believers this morning, and you're confronted with what the Bible says, and you know it's true, and you know it might cost you something. We get so terrified of that. I'm not even talking about dying. I'm talking about discomfort. I'm talking about embarrassment. I'm talking about making my face blush because I actually believe that. We stop. I submit, we are not Naboth's. We are the elders of Jezreel. And we're scared to death to stand on this word. But this is a book that, by God's grace, taught us of salvation. This is a book that we're trusting our eternal souls to. This is a book that I'm saying, Christ said, and I believe, and therefore I will live forever. And yet when it tells us how to live our lives, we're terrified of that. Injustice flourishes not only by wickedness, like Jezebel, but it flourishes by weakness, like the men of Jezreel. Not only does injustice flourish because of a lack of goodness, but it flourishes because of a lack of guts. Are you afraid? The truth is, we are. We're afraid as husbands as fathers, as moms, as grandparents, as citizens, as community people, in our places of work. But again, may I submit to you that we're fearing the wrong thing. Look this morning at Matthew chapter 10. And let's just jump down, if we can, to verse number 28. Matthew 10, 28. Here's what Jesus says. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And Jesus is trying to get us to think the right way here. Sure, we are terrified at times. We are fearful at times. We are afraid of what might happen. And Jesus says, don't worry about that. Who cares? They might kill your body. They might make fun of you. They might call you something. But the truth is, don't worry about that. You should fear the one who can kill both body and soul in hell. I could still be fearful, but this is a greater fear. It helps us. So, let us determine not to be weak or gutless, but to stand upon God's word. It abides forever, and they who do his will will abide forever. Third lesson this morning, final one. What do we learn from Naboth's story? And before I tell you what I I believe we can learn here, let me just help you again to remember what happened to Naboth. Here he is, following the will of God, honestly. And, and the community has a big feast, and they say, Naboth, we want to put you up as the, you know, you're the man. Put you right front and center. And so he's up there. And all of a sudden, these two witnesses come in, and they're worthless people. They're liars. And they say, hey, um, Naboth, good to have you. But we know that you cursed God and the king. And Naboth is thinking, what in the world's going on here? I thought this was like a day of uh, prayer. I thought we were going to have a pig roast afterwards. It wouldn't be pig. It would be Beef roast, they're Jews, right? Beef ribs. I thought it was going to be great. All of a sudden he starts hearing this, and in his mind now, it, now the wheels are going. I'll say, uh-oh, wait a minute. This is not good. And it keeps on going. And these false witnesses come before him, and they accuse him, and when it's all said and done, Naboth loses his life. Two false witnesses. Now, let me read a portion of Scripture with that in mind, and I'll make my last point this morning. Matthew, chapter 26, verse 59. Now the chief priest and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, they found none. 
at the last came two false witnesses. May we say men of Belial, worthless men. And they said, this fellow saith, I am able to destroy the temple of God. Blasphemy. You've cursed God. And to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? And you know the story. These false witnesses are believed by the council. And Jesus gives his life. My third point is simply this. There is a Naboth who understands. Amy Carmichael said, Can we follow the Savior far? who have no wound or scar. Can we follow the Savior, any Savior far, who has no wound or scar? And 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 what she's asking is, can we really follow anyone who's never suffered, who's never had any heartache, who's never had any pain? How far do you follow a Savior like that? And the answer is, not very far. We have a Savior who shares our suffering. We have a Savior this morning who emphasizes, who feels, who knows, who relates. And maybe this morning you're here and and in your mind and in your heart and in your situation you're saying, you know what? I'm sitting in this church surrounded by all these people, but the truth is nobody knows how I feel. Nobody knows what's going on in my life. Nobody even cares about what's happening to me. And may I suggest to you that that's wrong. Because there is a Naboth. There is a Savior. There is one who knows and understands and cares and feels your pain. Listen to the writer of Hebrews. And and, and remember, Hebrews is being written to Jewish believers who were excited to come into Christianity. And it was great at the start. Really good. Until their families turned on them. Their trade unions turned on them. They had no relationships, they had no jobs, they had no money, and now they're thinking, oh my goodness, we should go back to Judaism. And the writer of Hebrews is writing them to say, listen, don't go back. And it's almost as if you could hear the Jewish community saying, listen, you Christians, we have a sacrifice, we have ritual, we have a high priest, we can see, we can feel, it's tangible, you have nothing. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says, chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, which is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Yes, we have a better sacrifice. We have a greater high priest. We may not see him, but we know that he's passed into the heavens. He stands before God, and he, he, he advocates for us. And he says, therefore... Because of that, because of our high priest who's in the heavenly places before the throne of God, hold on. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't be weary. This is our high priest. He is God the Son who lives forever to make intercession for you. Hold on. It's a great truth. That's not the end. He goes on verse number 15 and says, as if that's not enough. Verse number 15. For... We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was tested like we are. And so this morning, as we think about this high priest, as we think about the story of Naboth, does anyone know? Does anyone care? Listen, he knows. He knows Hunger. He knows thirst. He knows pain. He knows weariness. He had no place to pillow his head. He knows real persecution. Unrelentless. Listen, I think the older I get, the more I understand the devastating blows of mocking someone. To have someone laugh at you is a terrible thing. I mean, you can act like it's not a big deal, but I promise you, you're surrounded by people who are mocking you, it is debilitating. And Christ in his ministry, everywhere he went, there were those who were mocking. It was unrelentless. It was persecution. He was called a glutton, a wine-bibber, a lover of drink, a deceiver, 
a blasphemer, illegitimate. He was called a devil. He knows. He understands. You say, I don't know. I've been rejected over and over again. You don't even know. Okay. How about this? Being rejected by an entire nation. That cried out, crucify him. Crucify him. Away with this man. I would think that would be rejection. He knew spiritual assaults by Satan himself. In the wilderness, the temptation. After 40 days starving, make some bread. Man shall not live by bread alone. Christ is victorious. Spiritual assaults by Satan. Spiritual assaults that are permitted by the Father. Lord, let this bitter cup pass from me. I I don't want to do this. My flesh knows what's coming. My spirit knows what's coming. God, please, if it be your will, nevertheless, thy will be done. And then to have the wrath of God poured upon his head. Do you know that Isaiah tells us it pleased the Father to bruise him? It pleased the Father to crush him? To take the wrath against sin, your sin and my sin, and pour it on the head of Christ? That the one who was innocent died for you, he died for me, he paid your price, he was forsaken, where he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I'm telling you this morning, we have a Savior who's a beautiful Savior, and he knows He knows all about it. He's a man of sorrow. Acquaints it with grief. And I tell you this morning that what he felt at Lazarus' grave in the shortest verse of the Bible, John 11, 35, Jesus wept, is what he feels for every one of his children who saw him. So this morning, wherever our trouble arises from, from men or demons, from mind or body, from God himself as he purges and prunes and refines. Know this, there is one who knows all about it. And you may say, that's not big, who cares, so what? So what? Do you know one of the powerful things about AA is that you're in a room with people who really know what it's like? They do a a grief share in our town. It's been very helpful for people. Why? Because people sitting in that room know that the person talking knows. We have our widow's tea that apparently we've got to change the name for now. Do you know what I've heard in that that gathering of women who have lost their husbands? I've heard one say to the other, I'm praying that you can muddle your way through because you're at where I was five months ago. And it is powerful. Listen, nobody wants to think, I'm the only guy. I'm the only girl. When I was in trouble as a kid, that's how I operated. If I got called down to the office, when I'm called down, I'm thinking, oh, stink. They know this, 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 and this. This person will sit you down. Hey, we know all about it. Who was involved? And I was a really good friend. I gave them all of their names, all of them. Like, if I'm going down, you're going down with me. Do you know why? Because there's something encouraging even if you're in trouble, to be in trouble together. That's the church. We're a bunch of misfits, and we're in trouble. We're broken, fallen, but we come together, and you know what? It's okay, because we're all messed up. We're all messed up. And when I know that there's a Savior who loved me, who gave himself for me, who knows all about it in ways I could not know, and listen, not to, oh, he's God, he knows. Yeah, I got it. But he knows experimentally. He walked our sod, breathed our air. He felt, he experienced. And so he knows. And the writer of Hebrews says, therefore, come boldly before the throne. Come, run into his presence. Kick open the door and listen to this throne. It is a throne of grace. I mean, a throne of grace. 
and we come there to find mercy to help. It covers our past and have grace in our time of need, our present. It is there. Why? Because there is a Naboth who understands all about it. And this morning, in our struggles, I'm telling you, come boldly. You come to a Savior who knows. (sighs) Is there anything better than that? That the God of heaven knows. And so don't sit here this morning saying, no, he knows. Ahab, pouting with your back turned. There's a congregation of people who do know. And there's a God in heaven who knows. He is there. He is ready. And he is able. Our lot is hard and difficult. And if someone told you the Christian life was anything but that, they lied to you. They lied to you. We're not going to lie to you. It's hard. If you stand on the word of God, there is a cost. But remember, we can take courage. We can hold fast because we have a Savior who knows all about it. And we praise his name for it this morning. Let's pray.